Hey, what's up? This is Dr. Corey Glenn with Blue Sky Bio. I was going to show a case. Uh, this is a complex uh, upper full arch case that I'm going to be doing for a doctor. And uh, we're going to be making stackable guides. The goal is to do uh, upper hybrid, lower dentition is in decent condition. And so what I'm going to show in this video, and then we'll continue on with some further videos, but I wanted to show how, first of all, I go about setting up the wax up, figuring out where it is that we're going, because I really don't need to jump in and start planning implants until I know prosthetically what we're doing. So just to get you filled in where we're starting from, this is just the patient's CT. Uh, one thing that's notable is that I always try to have docs I'm working with, and I would definitely recommend to you as well, for any complex case, you want to take that CT in the vertical dimension where you think you want to restore it at. Okay, so often we just get in the default mindset that, you know, have them bite on the bite fork and then we'll stitch all the stuff later. Well, that, that creates a lot of problems because, you know, what do you build your opposing occlusion to? Especially in dual arch cases, it's incredibly important. Try to get them in the VDO where you want. You can do simple checks with, uh, with calipers, just, you know, opening them up with the leaf gauge until they're at the right VDO based on facial proportions. And then just stick some wax between their teeth and let them bite down and hold in that position so that they can be there during your CT scan. If you'll do that, I promise you it's going to save you a ton of time. Uh, there, there's so much, you know, I, I can't really explain to you without a little bigger foundation. Just take my word for it. That's going to help you a tremendous amount. So that was done here. So you see this is an open bite, but that's not because of the patient you know, biting on a bite fork or anything. They are propped open at the correct VDO. And this patient is a class three patient. If he were to close down all the way, you would see that his anterior uh, lower teeth actually come up just past end to end. And so, you know, if we want to try to restore this guy into a class one or even an end to end relationship, we're going to need that space from opening him up slightly. So uh, take that for what it's worth. You want to open them up a little bit. And then where we're starting from in the case is I have just, uh, I brought in the intraoral scans. I've also had segmentation done through Diagnocat. And so all of these files you're seeing right here, I didn't, I didn't do segmentation on them. That's just uh, what was provided to me through Diagnocat. And one of the things that's notable that I wanted to show you is this facial soft tissue. Okay, so uh, a lot of us are going through lots of hoops to generate facial scans because it, it really is a valuable treatment planning tool. Um, but I found most of the, the systems that are available currently are a lot of trouble to incorporate. Granted, they're very valuable if you do, but they can be a pain in the butt. The scans are long. It's a lot of processing power. Um, you got to stitch it all in, which adds a lot. So this is not as good as a full color facial scan, but I would recommend you start doing this. If you've got a CT scan that is large enough to take a larger field of view, one of the things I found very valuable from the Diagnocat segmentation is the fact that it does get the soft tissue. And so this is super valuable because now I can, I can look at the facial midline. I can see where the lips fall, and that's going to really aid me in doing my initial setup, okay? So with the, all that said, let me go ahead and uh, figure out which files that I want to do. You know, I've, I've shown many cases uh, already of doing wax ups in Blue Sky Plan. So I thought maybe I'd just switch it up a little bit and show perhaps doing a, a wax up in ExoCAD just to show something different. OK, so what I'm going to need is the upper and lower model. Um, I am also going to need that facial soft tissue. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and export all of these. And we will save these in and we'll save these in my documents and I'm going to call this CY demo case. So uh, I could split these out, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to just do these all together and uh, let's just say face. Okay, so with that done, I'm going to open that folder. And I'm going to go ahead and open this file in Mesh Mixer because I'll show you a quick tip that I think is, is very helpful regardless where you're doing the wax up, uh, whether it's an ExoCAD, Blue Sky, 3Shape, whatever. Um, so 
what I'll do right now is I'm just going to separate all these files. Okay, so if I just go to edit, separate shells, and now I have uh, the face, okay, I've got the lower arch, I've got the upper arch, and then if I hide those, I don't know what the heck all this other stuff is. Those just look like little bits and pieces of mesh, so I'll just delete all of those. Oops. From there to there, we'll delete those. And now we've got the, the files that I wanted to work with, okay? So here's what I was going to show you about, uh, you know, making your wax up easier. You know, you can, you can do your wax up with this facial scan on, but I find it to be kind of in my way as I'm trying to do that. And it's a little more difficult to get yourself aligned. So just a simple cheat that I do is I'll go into Mesh Mixer and I'll just bring in, let's say, a, a cube, okay? And then I'll resize this. I'll usually make this be like half a millimeter thick, okay? And now I'm going to pull this over and make this a facial plane that I can utilize for uh, doing my setup. All right, so I'm going to try to align it right here. You know, if I was doing this without that facial soft tissue, I would be doing it purely on the maxilla. And you can have definitely some uh, discrepancies between uh, the, the face and, you know, where, say, the midline of the maxilla is. So between both of them, I can get a really good idea. All right, so I want this, when I look at it, to appear to be going straight through the face. Now, this is a kind of mid-range field of view. Okay, so it got up to halfway up the nose and part of the chin. It's even better if you can get the full face because now you're, you can see inner pupillary. Some of them are even big enough you can see to allotragus. But, you know, for our purposes, I think this is going to do the trick. And so what I want to do is get this where it's coming right through that facial midline. Okay. We can tilt it as needed. And then as I'm looking here, I want this to come through the middle of his maxilla as well. And now that looks like a pretty good compromise between the two of them. Okay, so we've got that. And now what I can do is I can say edit, duplicate, and let's just hit T for transform because there's a second one of those and I'm just going to rotate this by 90 degrees. Okay, and now I can move this up and down. And, you know, you're going to want to have a little bit more length hanging down below uh, his current incisal edges and so here's where I would utilize pictures now I've got a picture I'll pull this up this is that guy when he smiles uh, you can see the end-to-end -end bite here right so he's been opened up that gives me the freedom to now add some incisal length which he most certainly needs granted he's he's kind of got a longer face already um, but I think we can make this look a lot better if we lengthen these maxillary teeth and then they're going to need to come out a little bit too to get, again, more of a slight class one relationship. So as I'm doing that, I'm just trying to think to myself, how much longer should we go? And, you know, I would always rather air a little bit too long because it's easy to shorten temps in the mouth, but it's pretty difficult to add to them. So I'm going to say, let's go about right there. All right. Uh, I, I also know that the average central incisor is 10 millimeters in length, so I could even just pull in some kind of object. It's actually probably, uh, for a guy with a longer face like this, I'm going to say an 11 millimeter tall central incisor. And I could just simply pull this over and look at how we compare lengthwise to this. Okay, so pull that up to the gingival margin. And if we wanted to give him an 11 millimeter central incisor, then again, we can just pull this down until we correspond to that. Boom, right there. Okay, and then I can delete that. So what I've generated here now becomes a, a facial plane that I can use during my setup. I'm going to combine the two of these files. Okay, and now I'm going to export them. And I'm going to call them facial planes. And then 
here is my maxillary model. Here is my facial model. And I can just overwrite what I called face earlier. And now I just need to find that opposing, which it looks like I managed to delete. So I'm just going to re-export that from Blue Sky Plan. Just the opposing. All right. So again, I'm going to demonstrate this in ExoCAD. And so when you launch ExoCAD, uh, you'll have to you know put in your, your stuff here. But what I would like to do is a maxillary wax up. Okay, so I'm going to go, uh, no, actually, I'm, I'm going to call that one missing. So one of the things that kind of annoys me in ExoCAD is that you have to be so specific on your, your naming of stuff. So you've really got to tell it exactly what teeth you're wanting to wax up. It's not like in Blue Sky where you can just add and remove and all that kind of stuff. So even though we won't go back to second molars, I'm going to do a second molar to second molar wax up. So whenever you're doing this, um, I like to choose Pontic Wax Up. All right, if you choose Anatomic Wax Up, you're going to have to define gingival margins and all that kind of stuff, and I don't really want to do that. I'm going to print this, and so I'll just say printed. Um, and then we got to dial in what all do we want to include additionally. So I'm not going to do a pre-op model. I'm not going to do an extra scan. This design wax up, I want to design it digitally. This is not a deal where I've done a physical wax up and I want to scan that and, and adapt it digitally. Okay. Virtual extractions, what the heck, let's just say yes. Uh, design virtual gingiva, I'm going to make that optional in the wizard. And with all that done, I can hit OK, but that's only doing it for one tooth. So if I hold Shift and then click on the opposing tooth here, that's going to fill that out. Okay, and then I like to, uh, this is ultimately going to become my immediate load temp, and so I like to connect the teeth to, by hitting this green dot, it's going to actually put connectors in there. And so we'll just say that's omitted, and we're just doing two stone models in occlusion. Now I'll show you how I'll bring in that information about the, the face and the facial planes and all that kind of stuff. But two stone models in occlusion, let's save that and now we're ready to launch. So let's go to design. Okay, so it's going to prompt us for the upper jaw first. So let's go to our documents and get the maxillary model. And then it wants the antagonist. There's our opposing. Okay. Okay. Now, quick heads up on this. Note that I am not moving this model whatsoever. This has already been aligned to Blue Sky Plan, which means that if I reorient this or anything now I've changed the model orientation so anything I export out of there I'm gonna have to go back into blue sky plan and realign and all that kind of stuff so since this looks good I'm, I'm looking down on the occlusion of the upper I'm not gonna do anything other than click next that's gonna keep all of my model orientations the same alright so now it wants to uh, start prompting me to do the virtual extractions alright so let me just count K9, premolar, premolar, first molar, second molar. We're going to ignore these third molars. In fact, that'll be a useful reference. So identify tooth 17. That's this one. All right, so ExoCAD goes ahead and it uh, tries to predictively segment what tooth that is. All right, and I'm not worried about this being perfect, so we'll just roll with that. You could correct this if you wanted to. All right, that's good enough. And we'll click Next. Now, one of the things I didn't remember to do is uh, tell it that this tooth was missing. This is what I was talking about with this ExoCAD framework being really rigid in how you approach it. So I'm going to click this, 
knowing that it's going to have a tough time finding what it wants to segment. And I'll just correct this line here. Um, so what I can do is just go here to margin and just say clear all points and then I'm just going to define my own margin. And what this will do is just create kind of a ovate ponic site. All right, we'll click next. Now for the sake of time, you can see I'm just going to go through here and click each of these teeth individually. Um, so since you've seen me do that now, I'm going to just go ahead and let this uh, be time lapsed and we'll go a little quicker through the video. All right, now we're going to do this last tooth. You know, for whatever reason, after I did that correction of my margin earlier, um, from that point forward, it really started to not be able to, to read these teeth just automatically. I don't know what's up with that. You know, sometimes these things just do weird stuff. So what I've been doing on those since then is just kind of manually outlining these teeth. And... You know, I'm not trying to be super careful with this. Really, all I'm after is a model that doesn't have uh, these teeth on it. But I would kind of like to see these indentions of where those teeth would have been. And so this will work fine for our purposes here. So we'll click Next. And now that aspect is done. And now we are going to proceed with this. I don't really care about the axis of insertion, so I'll just click next. Okay, so that generated our wax out, our, our wax up bottom and all that. I don't really care about that. I'm really just after a tooth setup here. Uh, now we would choose our library of teeth. Do you want to use generic? Most people just use generic. I really like these HD teeth, so I'm going to choose that. And then, uh, you know, it's going to prompt you where should you first click. So the position of tooth 17. I'm going to just hide this antagonist right now. So, all right, that's over here. So that one. And then click on the 27 right there. And then we'll click next. I know that doesn't align well yet, but that's okay. So what it's doing now is it's turning this basically into a tooth chain that is going to be really easy to alter and to position. All right, so if there's anything I see people oftentimes, uh, you know, what I would consider to be wrong in ExoCAD is that they don't spend enough time in this stage. You know, if you'll, if you'll take the time to really, really dial in your overall alignment of these teeth, then it's going to make life a lot easier when you go to the fine tuning. In fact, I find I usually have to do very little fine tuning. All right, now I want you to remember this was taken in that opened bite where he's going to be restored. So I don't want to just align it to these teeth. I actually am thinking about aligning it to these. Okay, he is uh, going to be in a you know a cross bite, so I don't expect this to align you know in a perfect class one occlusion, right? Normally we'd have that mesial buckle cusp occluding right there, but we're, we're kind of offset a half tooth distance. So I'll usually start by positioning this very back. All right, I know that's impinging a bit and that's okay. But what I am trying to do is I'm noticing functional cusps, okay? So right here, here's the central groove of that tooth. And I want my lingual cusps occluding in there, even though I know that's really heavy right now. And now with that done, since those uh, back portions are locked, I can start pulling in these teeth, okay? And you can see how easy that is, all right? Now here's where it's going to be helpful for me to have those facial planes that I generated. 
So if you want to import something, you can go to, I think you've got to go, yeah, you're going to have to go to expert mode. So we'll get out of the wizard for a moment. And then under tools, we're going to say add or remove a mesh. All right, so we can call this a generic mesh visualization. So we're going to load this. And we're going to grab the facial planes. All right, and then just OK. You don't have to align this. Remember, we didn't mess with any alignment stuff. If I wanted to, I could also bring in that facial soft tissue. All right, there's that. But again, I don't, I don't especially need the face now that I've done that plane. All right, so I do like to make this plane somewhat transparent so that I can see through it. And now my life's going to get a lot easier with doing this setup. So just jump back to the wizard now. And I was working in chain mode. That's what I'll do most of this in. So now, as I'm thinking about, you know, length of the teeth, I know the midline. So I've got my midline on. And I'm going to start right there. Okay. And what else I'm going to do is start by getting the occlusion somewhat dialed in on these anteriors. So he's going to need a little bit of over jet. So I'm not trying to get it perfect. We can cut away the intersections later, but I do want to bring it out far enough that he's got a little bit of overjet. Otherwise, he'll beat the snot out of this restoration. So since my anterior teeth are set, my midline is set, let's lock those two anterior teeth. And now we can start looking back here. OK. So as I'm looking here, I kind of like that canine position. It's relatively well superimposed over his current canine. That looks like it's a pretty good relationship, so I'm going to lock that one. This side, I could maybe go out just a little bit, but I, I really don't want to move those teeth. So I could, I'm going to hold control and just spin this and tip it ever so slightly right there I just want to look at it make sure I didn't make it look goofy and you know what I actually don't like that so I will control Z that and just looking at how thick this incisal edge is I'm, I'm gonna leave it alone and we'll just cut that away all right so now I want to start thinking posterior tooth occlusion all right, so again, having your transparency on this opposing model, I'm going to unlock that. And I'm going to start pulling these teeth in until I see uh, functional cusp occluding right in the middle of the occlusal groove of these uh, opposing teeth. All right, I've got that one dialed in. So I'll lock it. That looks pretty good. This opposing tooth, you see how it's kind of kicked out of the arch form, so we're not going to get that one as perfect as we'd like, but I could pull that in maybe just a hair. Okay. And then while I'm at it, I'm going to look at the uh, occlusion. And usually I find this most easily done by just kind of doing a tooth at a time. All right, so this one right there. Just barely, barely an occlusion. And, you know, this is where I can fine tune this as well to make sure we're hitting in central groove. All right. I want to lock the teeth on either side of this. Again, this is not the only way to do this. This is how I like to do it. So take that for what it's worth. All right. There, I generated some occlusion. And. Actually, now that I'm looking, the, here again is where this plane is very useful. That tooth I'm cool with. This one I, I really think is 
kind of down too far out of the plane. So I'm going to move it up and get it more symmetric with that, which probably means in the next phase, I'm going to need to just extend this cusp of the functional cusp upward, but I don't want to create a goofy looking occlusal plane by making that one stay hanging down below the others. All right, let's move this tooth. So here, you know, I'm kind of having this big step. So as opposed to bringing this up and down, you know, one thing I could do is just hold control and tip it a little bit. Again, making that more symmetric. And then I'm not terribly worried about that cusp because I can bring that cusp down in the next step. All right. And then finally this tooth. Let's, uh, let's lock that and let's start tilting that for a little bit of a, what do you call that, curve of speed, I think. And then bring it up slightly. The further back I go, the normally the, the more I want to start relieving those contacts for an immediate load case like this because, you know, your, your occlusion is going to have to be adjusted. So you're always going to have to adjust more in the posterior, right? Opening one millimeter in the posterior means three in the anterior. So I'd rather err towards light contacts in the posterior. All right, so we're done with that. Now let's start working on this posterior quadrant back here. I'm going to pull this. You see the central cusp or the centric cusp, and I want it to go right on the marginal ridge of these teeth. So about right there. And that's already got a good contact. Could maybe pull it down just a hair. Knowing that puts it in hyperocclusion, that's all right. We'll fix that at the next step. Now let's lock these. And again, I, alignment's not bad. We can roll with that and then pull it down a little bit. You know, it's getting close to where it's not going to occlude. So I'm just going to get it symmetric with this guy. Let's do the same here. We don't have a tooth to set against, so let's just align that on the plane. And again, let's start creating a little curve of speed, tilting that tooth backwards. And by doing just that tip, you see I, I really relieved a lot of that occlusal contact intensity. So let's just give it a good once over and see if we like our alignment. That looks pretty good to me. Um, yeah, I might actually want to make these centrals a little bit bigger. One thing that's kind of just jumping out at my eye is that those centrals look like they could use a bit more width. So holding shift, actually let's cancel that and let's go to simple because simple is going to let me scale a tooth without affecting anything else. And then I'm going to just scale this tooth as well. And the fact that I'm creating that little bit of a, you know, impingement between teeth, I don't care about that because, again, I want these to all be a one-piece monolith anyway. All right, let's, uh, let's maybe rotate this ever so slightly. And same on this guy. And then looking from the front, remember your teeth, if you were to kind of draw a line down their axis, they should all be pointing at the belly button. So I want to get the axes of the roots angulated correctly. And then since that opened up a tiny bit of a contact, I'm going to scale these up again ever so slightly. I know I'm a little bit beyond my plane, but again, that's easy to adjust if, if it ends up looking not ideal. I do 
actually want to realign my midline to ideal. And now let's just turn off that uh, that alignment thing. That's looking pretty good to me. I'm, I'm making sure I don't have any wide open contacts. I think that looks pretty nice. All right, so we're going to click Next. So that's the place where I spend the majority of my time, and I see a lot of people when they're using ExoCAD, they, they do kind of a crappy job aligning things initially and then have to spend a ton of time here. You know, this is for fine-tuning. This is not for overall placement, right? So now, since everything's in the right spot, I'm just grabbing cusp tips. I'm pulling them down a little bit. For those anteriors, they've got plenty of thickness, so I'm going to just actually just do a uh, remove tool to bring those down. Okay. We're probably not even going to include these second molars in this wax up, but anyway, I'll do them. It just takes a second. Pull this guy down. And I'll, I'll usually try to get it to where I've got those light, light blue contacts, you know, you're not going to get occlusion on this one. Uh, all of those look good. I could probably pull this up to generate a contact on this one. Within reason. I don't want to make it super long. So maybe pull that right there. And we could pull that right there. All right, so even though it's not showing a contact, I know I've got one. So for my anterior teeth, I'm just going to go into the free tool. I don't necessarily even need my, uh, my posing on right now. So I'm going to just turn that off. And now I'm going to just use the remove tool. So I'm holding shift. Okay, so you can see these light blue contacts everywhere. That That's what I'm after. Um, so that looks good. I'm going to go ahead and click Next. And I, it's reminded me I haven't adapted anything. I don't really care to uh, adapt my contacts, right, because this is all going to get fused together into one thing. However, one thing I probably should correct if I go back, um, let's go to anatomic and say lock the equator. And some of these, uh, you know, root prominences, I want to bring those on back. So by locking the equator, that's going to kind of lock your anatomy in place, but allow you to, you know, get these to where that, that neck of the tooth is not sticking out so aggressively. It's not as bad on this side. Um, probably bring that canine back a little, and that one, and that one. Everything else I think we can work with. All right, so next. I do not want to adapt to any model teeth, right? I'm just gonna click next. And now we're going to do our gingival base design. So again, I'm not terribly concerned about making this perfect. Uh, in fact, I will typically go kind of deep down here with this. And now that I've closed that, it's going to generate a gingival base. All right, so there is our gingival base. And we're going to click Next. I don't need that pre-op jaw scan. So here I'm, I'm kind of doing this with complete disregard for the, uh, you know, the underlying tissue. Because again, this is a... This is a complex full arch case. We're going to pull everything 
tooth wise we're going to do bone reduction so if i've got a piece of that model shining through i'm not terribly concerned about it uh, but what i do want to do is go ahead and thicken up the gingiva i want to make sure it kind of fills the interproximal space and in particular on the lingual because when you're making this this is going to eventually become our immediate load restoration and a lot of your strength since you want the buckle to look as natural as possible a lot of your strength comes from the thickness of your lingual on that hybrid type restoration so let's go ahead and bulk that up a little bit save ourselves some trouble later on so i'm just using the large area and just pulling this up i want to cover more of the necks of those teeth again just to give myself more thickness All right, that's looking nice. Um, again, I probably won't even include that second molar, but nonetheless, we'll cover that up. We can also, any place that we feel like it's covering too much of the tooth, kind of relieve that. So that canine I thought was covering a bit too much. I'm gonna switch to the small area tool. That's covering a little too much, as well as that. Fill in that black triangle. And then again, I'm gonna bulk up this distal area. Okay. And then I'm just gonna look for kind of symmetry as well. Let's give it some thickness here. And then we're always able to go with the smooth surface. And, uh, you know, I can just kind of run that across here just to make this a nice smooth contour. I definitely want to smooth that out. There we go. And I'll just give it a quick hit across all of that. Increase the strength so it is a bit more active as I do this. There we go. All right, so that is, uh, you know, roughly what I would do here. I'm going to add a bit to the necks of these centrals, thicken that up a bit, maybe on the canines as well, and then once again, I'm just going to smooth it ever so slightly. All right, so there's our uh, virtual wax up, kind of quick and dirty. I'm going to click Next. Now it's generating the connectors, and so I will typically pull these connectors, um, you know, more lingually. So right now I don't need the jaw scan on. I don't need the pre-op. Um, I'm going to make this gingiva where it's not quite as right and you can play with your different connector designs but what I'll probably do here is first of all just pull them down further because I've got the room to And then I want to look at uh, the position from buckle to lingual. I want those more offset, either right in the center of posterior teeth or a bit more lingually positioned because I don't want them shining through to the buckle here. All right, so especially like on these anterior teeth there. See how that's now not going to be showing near as much.
All right, so that looks like that will work. Give it one more look over. I like it. Click next. Um, we'll save that. By the way, never a bad idea to save your project as you go along. Because if you get stuck or have a crash or something, you want to not have to redo this. Okay. So with that done, I'm going to click next. Okay. So now we have a solid wax up. And what I'm going to do is save this. So, you know, you could save it as a project, but really what I'm after here is, is the STLs. So I just right click and say save scene as, but then change this from a CAD scene just to plain STL. And then go and save it in your documents uh, or wherever you're saving this. And I'm going to call this solid wax up with gingiva. Save just the visible objects. All right, and now I'm going to hide that and I'm going to turn on these things individually. All right, so this was all the teeth plus my gingiva before the adaptation between them. I want to do the same here because I'd like a file that I can. If I want to tweak the gingiva or something, I can do that, and it's not all merged together already. So I'm going to save this also just as STL, and we'll call this, uh, let's go to the right folder first. We'll call this wax up uh, components or whatever you want to call it. And yes, we just want to save all these visible components. Okay, so we finished up that ideal wax up in ExoCAD, and all I've done now is just bring that data right back into uh, Mesh Mixer, into the same plan I had. Remember, this was our setup jig. Uh, we've got the face here, and so this is now what we need to go ahead and begin planning the implants. Now, there's one thing I'm going to do before uh, planning the implants because, again, it's going to help us a lot in uh, in Blue Sky once we get over there to know the depth. And so what I'm doing here is just turning off all those files. So very similar to how I made that, uh, you know, plane for setting the teeth, I'm going to bring in another one. And I'm going to pull this one over and basically align it with the occlusal plane of this, you know, ideal wax up. All right, so again, I want to make this pretty thin. Uh, you can always just punch in the numbers here. I'll usually make it like half a millimeter. And I want to get it right under the wax up. And we'll make this pretty big. And what I want to do is now pull this up and basically align it right to my occlusal plane as best I can. So it looks pretty good from left to right. From this dimension, it needs to be tilted just slightly, so I'll tilt that. And now just raise it up. And I'll usually try to raise this up until I see, you know, cusp tips poking through kind of evenly throughout. And I could stand and maybe go up just a hair with it right there. Okay, so that looks like that's pretty even to the occlusal plane. Now, the reason that I do that is because I want to now take this and make this um, essentially 17 millimeters tall. Okay, so the way I can do that is what I'd like to do is just extend this top portion straight up 17 millimeters. Now, how do I select just that top portion? Well, I can go to generate face groups. And when you do generate face groups, it's looking for changes in contour, so sharp edge angles. And where it finds those, it's going to turn that into its own individual face group. So by virtue of doing that, I have just created something where I can only click that bottom part. And then I'm going to go to Edit, Extrude. Remember, I've already got this where it's a half millimeter thick, so I'm going to extrude it upwards 16.5 to represent where it would give me a uh, 17 millimeters of prosthetic space. 
okay? And really, I don't even need the rest of this now, so I'm going to hit I for invert and just delete that. That is my 17 millimeter plane of uh, reduction, essentially. So that's where, if we wanted to have the the absolute ideal prosthetic space, you know, we're gonna we're gonna end up with a hybrid that's essentially 14 millimeters thick. Because I'll I'll reduce the bone down 17, and then the hybrid is going to sit three millimeters off the bone reduction. So that's pretty much an ideal prosthetic space. So what I'm gonna do, and I like to make this kind of big. So I might even make it a little wider there. And one thing I'm going to point out, you know, I just hit W on the keyboard, which uh, turns on the wireframe. You'll notice that this, uh, this mesh is really, really not dense at all. Compare it to the density of the mesh here. And Ultimately, what I'm going to use this for is not only implant planning, but then I'm going to use it as my plane of reduction. I'm going to use it for cutting down my, uh, my hybrid to the right dimensions. And one thing I know is that when you've got really, really big mesh density, it's going to not play well with those Boolean functions. So all I can do here is simply hit, uh, you know, select it all. I, that's control A. And then you can go to re, uh, remesh or just hit R on your keyboard but then let's increase the density okay and then I'm gonna do it again R for remesh and I might go one more that's about the mesh density I'm looking for okay and then with that done I don't I don't need this all uh, so I'm gonna just kinda get a big perimeter around the maxilla so that this thing is not so big and unwieldy when I'm looking at it in the softwares. Alright, I'll just hit Control G to make that a face group so that now if I click on both of these face groups, hit G for select uh, face groups, and then I for invert, delete that. I'll smooth the borders to and so what I'm going to do now is just save this file as plane of reduction. Now let's go back into Blue Sky. And I'm going to pull in both that wax up that we just generated. Oops. Let's import STLs. And I'm going to do this plane of reduction. And for some reason that's not showing, so let's make sure that that exported properly. Export. Plane of reduction. I don't want your stupid OneDrive space, Microsoft. So we'll just replace that one more time. And now we'll go back and pull it in. Import STL. And let's grab that plane of reduction and the solid wax up. Now remember, these are I've never changed the orientation of these files while I was outside the program. So when I pull them in, there's nothing to stitch or move. So when this pops up, you know, just exit out of it. All right. So now we're ready to start planning implants. So I don't need the face on anymore. We'll turn that off. I don't really need any of this or the opposing. I swear I hate Microsoft. Turn off all the stupid notifications. All right, uh, I do want the plane of reduction and I do want that wax up turned on so that I can see two positions. And then we can turn on the, the maxilla as well. All right, so let's start planning implants. Now, I've already done them in this case, so let's just go one by one and uh, find uh, the implants, you know, and just look at them where I've placed them. Okay, so the doctor doing this case is doing uh, BioHorizons implants, and he was, you know, wanting to go with six if possible. And so usually what I'm going to try to do is 
first of all, I'm looking at this depth. So can I go straight up and down and get a good AP spread? Well, not unless we do a massive sinus lift, which that's they'd like to avoid that if possible. Because remember, this is the depth of my implant placement. So as I look at that, I know we can't go straight up and down unless we just had like a shortened dental arch from first premolar forward, which makes me start thinking disto angled. All right, so we're gonna go disto angled to uh, sneak under that sinus, but still emerge, you know, roughly first molar here. Um, do have some infection in that site. So he'll have to graft that, but I'm just spinning this implant on its axis. Now, a lot of times people will get confused about how do you evaluate your prosthetic emergence. And so what you can do is you can, uh, you know, I've always uh, used these custom abutments, but I'll make them 20 millimeters long, four or five millimeters in diameter. But if I wanted to see where a 30 degree multi brings that to, I'm gonna put the angle at 30 degrees but then the question arises, well, 30 degrees, which way? Is it going to be sticking out over there? And reality is you don't know until you start playing with this. So a 30 degree multi, I want to spin it. Now notice this is only spinning the implant on its axis. If we could look from down below here, that blue ring, you see that implant position is not changing other than its uh, axis of rotation. So the timing of the implant. So let's just play with that until we get a 30 degree multi emerging where we would like it to. And I'd like to come right through the middle of the occlusal table. All right, there's one. And now let's go get the other uh, disto angled implant. Same thing was done on that as we look at this other one. So I try to position the ones as distal as I can get it because then that dictates what can fit in between them all right will it be an all on four because all I can get is two more in the anterior I know these are as far back as we can go so this is the uh, patient's right side and again we're sneaking it in past the sinus and we're coming out roughly first molar with the emergence now you'll see here on my plane of reduction Usually what I'm going to try to do with the disto angled is get this where roughly it goes right through the middle. Okay, so that means you're going to have a little portion sticking up, a little portion down here. But I find if you go too deep with these, you end up profiling so much that it, you know, you can end up getting deep towards the sinus. So I kind of split the difference. I go right in the middle. All right, so we've got those two implants in their most distal positions. Now let's start filling in in between them. So usually what I'll do next is try to get two implants as far anterior as possible. Okay, so there you see the incisive canal. So unless the doc is comfortable enucleating that and putting one in the incisive canal, then you know you probably need to just put one as close to it laterally on each side as you can and then go from there. So again you see my position relative to the plane of reduction just barely below it and actually that lingual portion is just sticking above it. We are mostly avoiding the socket. You see that central incisor we're just going to be in that socket but again my depth is determined by this plane of reduction which is 17 millimeters higher than my occlusal plane. All right, so there is one of the central implants. Let's turn on the other. All right, again, right beside the incisive canal. We're really hugging this palatal, and I've not even been mentioning, but look at the occlusal emergence positions. I wanna be coming out roughly cingulums of anterior teeth, if possible. If, uh, let's say if this had a really abrupt angul angulation to it that was coming out here, then I would start playing with angled multis, bringing that back. But if I can go straight, I want to go straight multi-units everywhere possible. They're just a lot easier to deal with. All right, so let's start looking here at our implant positions. You see what we have so far, All right? and you see where the emergence positions are so far. So many people would just go with all on four and 
you know, as long as everything integrates, that would be a great setup. This should work well. Um, you know, I, I tend to want to over-engineer things, and so if I can get six in, if there's room to place more implants, I'd rather do it. Because, again, you know, the old adage, all on four, none on three. Um, if there's room, implants are so cheap that I'd like to have them there. Even if you don't tie them into the restoration, they're at least there if you need them in the future because of a failure or something. Okay, so let's start seeing if we can squeak some in in between those. So, I was able to get one right in between those. You see where that's emerging at the first premolar. Now, you see these warnings. It's because it's saying, uh, first of all, I, I usually ignore the software uh, guide to violation and drill kits. I'm going to deal with that because I'm going to reduce bone. Um, but you are seeing that we're getting this warning that our implants are too close together. Notice that's not at the crest, and that rule is primarily based on, uh, you know, keeping implants three millimeters from one another. That's, that's important at the crest. If down at the apex, those uh, apices get really close to one another, that's really not of any ultimate consequence. I don't want them touching, but if I'm two millimeters apart, I don't really worry about that. So this distance isn't a problem. This distance isn't a problem. All right, so that is the emergence position there. I try, if possible, to avoid that canine socket. I don't like placing an immediate right in a maxillary canine socket because you end up with such a huge buckle gap that it's hard to get primary stability. So if I can go a little bit to the side of it, now I'm engaging bone. So you see I'm more or less going right through that proximal bone between these. And then let's see if we can do the same thing on the other side. All right, so in this region now, let's turn on that implant. And now you see all of our implant emergence positions. Really nicely spaced. These are all straight multis. These two are 30 degree angled. Let's look at it in uh, cross section, all right? Once again, we're not that close to one another at the platforms, but we are at the apices, and I'm fine with that. This is a good example here of, of I couldn't really avoid being somewhat in that canine socket. So the whole facial of this implant is going to be grafted. And if you think about the occlusal forces, where are they directed out on this implant? Well, they're going from lingual, kicking it out to the buckle. I really would like to have good solid bone there to resist that, but we don't have it. So any engagement we're going to get is going to come from palatal bone and proximal bone. And, you know, by itself, I wouldn't immediate load this, but as long as it gets 30 newton centimeters of insertion torque and it's going to be tied in and splinted with these others, I wouldn't have any problem immediate loading that. Honestly, even if it was a little below 30, since it's going to have all those other implants to draw from. Okay? <clears throat> so that's just kind of a condensed version of the implant planning. Um,